out, uh, that. So a uh, big picture of today's lecture is that uh, you're talking about statistical aspects of how we try to link diseases. Uh, it doesn't have to be diseases. I mean, it could be um, you know, a neutral sort of trait as well, um, or, uh, but how we link diseases, phenotypes uh, to specific genetic variants and uh, be sort of a mix of some things we'll go into depth on, um, you know, just to try to illustrate uh, some of the concepts. Uh, other things, we can't, we don't have time to go into depth on everything, uh, so some things we'll more just touch on as we go. Um, and at the end, uh, I'll talk about how this works at the genome-wide scale and uh, sort of what we've learned over the past uh, 10 years or so from the uh, you know, effort of scientists uh, around the world to study things at the genome-wide level. So I'll start by just reviewing some terminology. Probably um, you know uh, this, these terms already, but just as a quick review to make sure we're, when I use these words, we're all uh, on the same page as far as what they mean. Uh, humans have uh, two copies of their genome, one you got from your mother, one you got from your father, um, and you pass on a copy, uh, one of those copies, uh, you know, to your offspring uh, at random. Uh, and at any given place, location on the genome called a locus, uh, there may be genetic variability or polymorphism, meaning that people have different sequences at that position. So uh, just as an example, here's a stretch of uh, DNA in the hemoglobin gene. Uh, and you know, everybody has you know, a C here and a C there and a G here and so on. Um, you know, that's a, not a polymorphic spot. You know, all humans have the same uh, sequence, you know, all along here. But, you know, at the spot here that I have colored, not everybody has the same spot, okay? And indeed, you know, like, since we have two copies, um, you might have, uh, both of your copies may have a C in this position, uh, or maybe uh, you have one of each. Maybe you have a C, a copy of the C uh, allele, and maybe you have a copy Maybe your other copy of this gene has a T allele in that position. Um, if you have both of your copies had a T allele, uh, then uh, you would probably know about it because you would have a disease uh, called sickle cell anemia, uh, which is caused by you know, um, having two T alleles in this part of your uh, hemoglobin gene. Okay, so so again, there's uh, normally there's a lot a lot of positions in the genome where people are all the same, but the interesting places, of course, are where people are different because those are the ones that it would explain why some people get the dis get diseases and some people don't. Uh, so the more common allele is referred to as the major allele, and the less common one, the minor allele. Although keep in mind those are um, those are context dependent, can be population dependent. You may have um, one allele be the major allele among Europeans, but it could be the minor allele among Chinese or something like that. Uh, you know that, that depends on the population you're talking about. So um, this is usually quantified, kind of this, uh, how much more common it is by the uh, minor allele frequency. This is a common term to refer to uh, genetic variants that uh, characterize them. Um, and this is mosomes that possess the minor allele, okay? And you know, keep in mind, we have two copies of uh, each chromosome. So this is not the same thing as the percent of individuals that have a copy of the minor allele. So just to... Um, Give an, ex an example here. Um, suppose a variant has a minor allele frequency of 5%. Then if the variants are randomly distributed throughout the population, um, so this is a simplistic model for how genes and genetic variation mixes in a population um, known as Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. This basically is what would happen if you didn't, say, inherit a copy of a gene from your mother and from your father, but instead, you know, when people were born, it's as if they went into a big, you know, pop that, that had all the, all the genes for everybody, and we all just drew uh, genetic material randomly, two copies of a gene randomly from the same pool, and everybody did that. Um, as a simplistic model, often works reasonably well, um, but not always. Um, so if that was the case here, then mathematically what would happen, if the variant had a minor allele frequency of 5%, then uh, something like 90% of people would have two copies of the major allele. Um, something like 10% of people would have a copy of each, and uh, you know, only a 
fraction of a percent of people would have two copies of the minor allele. So uh, this is worth keeping in mind that you know some if you have a minor allele frequency of five percent, uh, it's really closer to ten percent of people have at least one copy of that minor allele. Okay, just as a distinction there. Okay, all right. So those are just some some terminology, some terms, some genetic, basic genetic terms. Probably uh, you've heard these terms before, but I wanted to uh, you know just review them for quick. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit. I'm gonna go over this relatively. I'm not gonna spend a ton of. I could certainly spend longer on this. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this because my focus really is going to be on uh, complex diseases. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit about sim simple diseases first. So the simplest form of genetic disease is one in which a single genetic variant is responsible for the disease. Um, these diseases are often called Mendelian diseases or Mendelian disorders since they follow uh, the classic pattern of genetic inheritance that uh, Gregor Mendel originally discovered with his pea plants in the 19th century. Uh, so these are mathematically described by an idea called penetrance, which uh, describes the probability that an individual with a certain genotype will express a certain trait or disease. Um, so for example, uh, cystic fibrosis is caused by an amino acid deletion in the CFTR gene, and its penetrance function would look like this. So if A denotes the uh, more common functional allele and B denotes the allele in which you have this amino acid deletion, uh, then its penetrance function looks like this. Basically, you know, if you have two functional alleles, you will not have the disease. Uh, if you have one of each, you also will not have the disease. Uh, you won't have cystic fibrosis. Uh, but if you have two copies of the cystic fibrosis, uh, of this deletion that causes cystic fibrosis, then there is a 100% chance that you will have the disease. So there's there's no really no uncertainty here. This is a uh, you know Mendelian disorder in the sense that you know uh, it's not a complex disorder where lots of things contribute to it. It's you know um, fairly it's very specific what causes this. If you have two copies of this deletion, you <clears throat> you absolutely will have the disease. If you anything else, you absolutely won't have the disease. Um, so the terminology, this is as I said to follow a recessive pattern because in the, you can be a non-symptomatic carrier of this uh, non-functional allele. Uh, and it has complete penetrance, meaning that if you have two of these, then there's a 100% chance that you will have the disorder. Um, so <clears throat> um, identifying the locus responsible for Mendelian disorders is accomplished by something called linkage analysis, which again, I could spend longer on, but I'll just sort of give you the basic idea. Um, you would choose markers throughout the genome, you know, a couple hundred markers, let's say, throughout the genome. And then uh, you'd obtain a you know, pedigree in which you'd follow people over time, you know, over generations, you know, from uh, parents to children, and you'd see, you keep track of two things, you know, which children inherited the disease from their parent, and which inherited the marble. You see whether those things are correlated or not. Um, you know, if every time the uh, child inherited the disease, they also inherited the marker, and that tells you uh, that that marker is probably is not necessarily causing the disease, but it's close in the genome to where the uh, disease causing allele is. Okay, so I've got a little picture of recombination here, because it's, I said you get, uh, you uh, inherit a copy of the genome from your mother and one from your father, and then you pass one on to your children. That's, that's not exactly what happens in the sense that, uh, you know, when you form uh, sperm and egg cells, you know, there's this recombination uh, event that happens where you mix genetic information between the two copies, uh, and you get something like a, you know, mixed copy that you pass on uh, to your, um, to, to, a, to a child. But um, what's key here is that, um, you know, there's these blocks here where a recombination, you know, uh, will happen, and things that are close together will be more likely to be inherited together in the same kind of recombination block. So, for instance, if the disease-causing allele is here in this orange segment, uh, the light orange, yellowish uh, segment, okay, then it'll be um, and any marker that's also in there, or that's close to it, will be more likely to be inherited along uh, in the same the same block. Okay, um, things that are farther away, they'll be more like the further away from the disease, the causative, uh, you know, uh, genetic locus, uh, the more likely there is to be a recombination event in between the two, and you maybe won't see them get inherited together. 
Okay, so that's the idea. Um, and you would do this and uh, do this for each marker and usually you'd see something like a bump, you know, where, uh, you know, there'd be, uh, you know, markers that are sort of in a certain area, you know, would be getting inherited along with the disease more often than chance alone. And that would tell you, uh, not exactly pinpoint exactly where the disease causing uh, gene or allele is, but give you a, a good, a rough idea where in the um, genome it is, and then further work would be necessary to isolate the specific genetic variant that causes uh, the disorder. Okay, this whole idea um, works quite well for identifying simple diseases or, you know, Mendelian disorders, but uh, less, less effective when we have complex diseases, when diseases have many things that contribute to them, when the penetrance is incomplete. So, for example, uh, let's, if we consider the disorder of cancer, breast cancer, and um, you know, mutations in the BRCA1 gene. Um, this is a more complex story here. Here, the probability of getting disease, of getting breast cancer by age 70, uh, if you don't have, I mean, you, you, it's still possible to get breast cancer um, if you don't have any mutations in your BRCA1 gene. It happens to 7% of women. Okay. Um, likewise, you are not guaranteed to get breast cancer, even if you do have a mutation in your BRCA1 gene. I mean, your chances go up, you know, very much, you know, from 7% to 60%. Uh, but, um, you know, it's still certainly possible to have a mutation in the BRCA1 gene and not develop breast cancer. Okay. And, and nobody has two, cop two mutated copies because that's a, a, a fatal uh, situation. Um, so anyway, you can still do linkage analysis here. Um, indeed, that's how BRCA1 was found in the first place. But uh, if you just think about it, it's going to be a lot harder in the sense that, I mean, there will be a lot of cases where you inherited, um, where you got, you know, you had the disease and your parent had the disease, but it's not actually because you inherited a genetic risk factor. I mean, that's possible for, you know, you can have these uh, confounding situations come in where, uh, you know, it's possible that you inherited the, the mutation but didn't get breast cancer or you know, that you developed the um, disorder even though you didn't inherit a mutation, things like that. Those all make it harder to do linkage analysis. You can still do it, but it just you need much larger sample size, much larger pedigrees uh, and so on. Um, and so this concept of penetrance is not really all that well suited to complex diseases. And so for complex diseases, a more flexible model called the proportional odds model is used. Okay, so this is, um, if you're, uh, the odds of a disease, we're probably more used to thinking about probabilities, but odds are related to probabilities. They're just a ratio of the number of times something happens to it not happening. So if I say that the disease's probability is 75%, then its odds are three to one, or just three, in the sense that for every, you know, if I'm saying it's seventy-five percent, then three out of every four times it happens, or for every, every for every three times it happens, there's one time it doesn't happen. Okay, so those are the odds, um, and the model, the proportional odds model, um, says that you know, we can characterize the impact of a allele on a disease um, in this proportional way. Okay, so the um, if X is just some collection of risk factors, and let's say, you know, we have a person over here that has certain risk factors, person over here that has certain risk factors, how much of the odds change is governed by this odds ratio uh, that compares the two. So just for example, suppose that a variant has an odds ratio of two. Well, what that means is if a person has a disease odds of 0 0.1, um, you know, let, you know, let's say the disease depends on lots of other things. I mean, it's a complex disorder. Maybe it depends on smoking and exposure to, you know, uh, environmental, you know, toxins and, you know, a bunch of other things. Um, okay, well, consider two people who have all the same environmental exposures, uh, but, okay, one person has the uh, a risk variant that has an odds ratio of two, that doubles the odds. If it starts out at say 0.1, then it doubles it to 0.2. Or if it started out at 0.2, it would double it to 0.4 and so on. Um, in terms of probabilities, that would mean going from 9% to 17%. 9% is the probability that goes along with the odds of 0.1 uh, and so on. So keep in mind, this doubles the odds. It doesn't exactly double the probability 
Okay, but so this is a, a flexible uh, model for describing the effect of a disease, the impact, sorry, the effect of a genetic variant on a disease, the impact uh, that a variant has on, on the likelihood that you'll have a disease. Okay, so now that we've defined these two key terms here, the minor allele frequency and the odds ratio, uh, I can show you this uh, picture um, that shows you the spectrum of disease allele effects and, you know, um, kind of communicate some key ideas here. So this is a, I'll spend a little bit of time on this slide because I think it's uh, important to understand what's going on here. Um, so most things, most variants that we have discovered in science uh, fall in this band here that goes, you know, across the middle uh, here, you know, can either be things like this uh, mutation we just talked about uh, in the CFTR gene, okay, that is rare but has a large effect, okay, on cystic fibrosis. Or you can, there are also uh, variants over here like this uh, um, variant in uh, the LMTK2 gene that increases your risk of prostate cancer among men, but increases it by a very, very, very small amount, okay. So you can see this is actually a very common uh, variant. It's not at all uncommon, but it has, you know, a fairly minimal uh, amount of uh, impact on breast cancer. You're slightly more likely to develop, sorry, I think I said breast cancer, prostate cancer. You're slightly more likely to have prostate cancer if you carry this genetic variant, but not much more likely. Okay, and most things fall in this band. Okay, so why, why is that? Why don't we see uh, stuff in the upper right? Okay, well, if it had... A, the, the reason is, you know, a natural selection and evolution. If something was up here, meaning that it had a large impact, it greatly increased your chances of getting a disease, then the sel selection pressure due to uh, um, natural selection uh, and evolution, it would push it to become less common over time. If something uh, causes disease, then, you know, there would be a pressure to make that uh, genetic variant more and more rare over time. Okay, so you tend not to see a lot of things up in this uh, upper right-hand corner. The exception here, you know, sort of sort of the exception that proves the rule is for, um, you know, these um, disorders like Alzheimer's disease and age-related macular degeneration. These are uh, disorders that predominantly affect the elderly, uh, sort of people that are beyond uh, reproductive age. And so there you can, you do occasionally see large effects for disor diseases like that. Um, you know, so uh, there are some things up there, but for most diseases, um, you know, you see more and everything falling in this band in the middle here. Um, what about the lower left corner. What about that? This would be things that are rare and have small effects. Um, what's up with this uh, lower left corner here? Why don't we see um, variants over here? Well, undoubtedly there are lots and lots of variants in this lower left hand uh, corner. Uh, it's just that these are really hard to detect. Um, if they don't happen very often, and even when they do happen, they don't do very much, um, it's just really hard to discover them, really hard to identify them. Um, so, you know, there are undoubtedly lots and lots of things down here, but we're just, uh, they're hard to find and we're just ignorant of them at this point uh, in, in science. But this has definitely been the uh, direction that genetics has headed over the past uh, decade or so uh, is to sort of push this boundary, you know, down closer and closer to the lower uh, left-hand uh, part of this figure. You know, I mean, you start off by finding, you know, these were among the first uh, gen genetic variants found, and then, you know, you can kind of push down farther into this uh, area over here as you get uh, more and more data, larger and larger, more powerful studies, um, you know, sort of this is where the boundary is at, you know, you're sort of pushing, pushing the boundary and sort of finding rarer variants with smaller effects, you know, this is, but uh, things up here are sort of the, uh, the lower hanging fruit, so to speak, um, you know, and then as, you know, you need more and more power, larger and larger data sets, you know, to kind of make progress in moving the boundary uh, further to that lower left um, corner. Okay. So um, I guess let me pause here and just, uh, you know, see, uh, you know, I think this is kind of a, an important, um, you know, uh, I guess at this point we, we have, I've talked about the uh, um, kind of the basically a review of terminology and kind of this idea of minor allele frequency effect size and how that kind of shapes our study of the, of the 
genetics. Um, any, any questions so far on anything I've talked about um, before, I, before I go on? Just wanna make sure people uh, are with me on those ideas before I keep going. Uh, okay, well, all right. Uh, so I don't uh, see any uh, questions, so that's fine. I can keep going, uh, but uh, certainly we'll have time for questions at the end. I just wanted to see if anybody had anything now. Okay, so one other thing I wanna talk about before I go on to uh, um, analyzing uh, complex genetic data is um, you know, how do we even know that genetics plays a role and how do we have any idea that genetic, you know, how big that role may be? Okay, so the extent to which a trait is determined by genetic factors is called its heritability. Um, and it's possible to estimate heritability in a number of ways, but the most common way, or at least the, uh, the most straightforward way to do so is by studying twins. Um, you know, it, you may think it's hard to, it would be hard, inherently hard to estimate heritability in the sense that, well, um, you know, as people are more genetically related, they're also tend to have more non-genetic things in common too. Um, you know, like just because two siblings, you know, both have a disorder. Well, you know, that's also, they grew up in the same house, you know, they, you know, had that the same socioeconomic status, all those kinds of things too. Um, you know, how do we, how do we disentangle those? Well, um, a key way is by looking at twins and specifically by studying the differences between identical and fraternal twins. Because the key thing here that lets us disentangle those two uh, things, the genetic from the environment, is that both identical both identical and fraternal twins share the same developmental environment. Um, the difference uh, is that identical twins share 100% of their DNA while fraternal twins only share 50% of their DNA. So if you see a disorder in which identical twins are basically no more similar than fraternal twins are, well, that would indicate that that's not, genetics is not playing a big role there. On the other hand, if you see something that identical twins are much more similar than fraternal twins, that tells you that the genetics is playing a big role there. So just to specifically um, break this down, um, if we have a model here that assumes that you can break down the total percent of uh, variability in a trait into three parts, the genetic, the environmental and random. So this is saying like even um, anything, like even identical twins aren't necessarily 100% identical in every way. So this is everything that's beyond what they share genetically and environmentally, you know, sort of extra random factors. That all adds up to, to one or 100%. Um, so if we work with this decomposition and the correlation between identical twins will be the G plus E part. They'll share the same environment, they'll share the same genetics. But the correlation between fraternal twins will look like this. It'll be share the same environment, but only share half the genetics. And so with these two uh, equations here, we can solve for G, that would be the herit heritability here, what we wanna know, the fraction of the total that's coming from genetics. Uh, and if you, you know, say, take this equation, subtract off the other equation, solve for G, uh, we have that this heritability here is two times the difference in correlations between identical and fraternal twins. So to see what this looks like, um, a large study conducted in Australia in the early 1980s uh, found that the correlation uh, of height among 1,232 female identical twins was 0.87 all the correlation among 751 female non-identical twins was 0.454. Okay, so this would be a situation in which the uh, identical twins were quite a bit more similar than the non-identical twins were. Um, and our heritability estimate here would be two times that difference, which gives us 83%. So this would be indicating that 83% of the variability in height can be attributed to genetics. Okay, that we can estimate that, um, even though we don't necessarily know what's, what specific variants are causing it, um, but just by looking at identical and non-identical twins, we can get an estimate of how much is coming from the genome, broadly speaking. Now, you know, identifying the specific variants that you know, explain this 83% is a different story, but uh, we can get an idea of the overall heritability uh, up front. 
Um, so it's important to make you know, a few notes before I move on here. It's important to note that heritability estimates depend on context and on the population we're studying. So for example, um, this 80% number uh, I just shared from this Australian study um, is pretty consistent with other studies. Other studies have also uh, pointed to numbers that the heritability of height is about 80%. Provided that those studies um, are among white adults living in developed nations, um, if you take the study in a different context, and you know the heritability can change, not necessarily because the genetics change, uh, but because the environmental factors may play a larger role. So we're estimating here a fraction of the total, and if the environment, if, if the genetics stays the same, but the environment plays a larger role the genetics will play a smaller role in the of the total just because they'll you know for them contribute a smaller percentage the larger the environmental factors are you know so for example i mean uh, living in a developed nation uh, typically uh, it's, it's not the case that uh, you know sort of uh, uh, hunger and you know food shortages and famine disease things like that uh, prevent you from reaching your full height uh, i mean it, it certainly can happen in developed nations but you know for the most part uh, those environmental contributions to height are are much play a much smaller role than they do uh, in, in other nations. So for example, a similar study right around the same time, but that was conducted in Western Africa, produced a considerably lower estimate in 65% uh, of heritability. Um, presumably not because the genetics is totally different in Western Africa uh, as it is in Australia, but more because uh, you know, environmental factors are playing a larger role. Uh, similarly, a 2004 study in China also estimated a heritability of around 65%. Um, I would assume, I would, I, would, I would bet that, for example, um, if you repeat this study in China, um, I don't know, either today or in you know, 20 years or something like that, uh, you'll see that 65% increase to close to 80% um, you know, as, as the um, living standards uh, in, in China have, have greatly um, gone up you know, over the past uh, you know, 25 years or so. So I mean, that's, and we've seen that in other nations, like in, for example, in Finland, you know, its heritability used to be like 60% and it's gone up to about 80% as it's, you know, over the course of the 20th century as it's become uh, a developed nation. Okay. Um, so just something to keep in mind with heritability is uh, it's not, it, you know, it's something of a, of a context dependent phenomenon that we're measuring. Okay. All right. So now we're going to uh, enter kind of the main part, I would say, of this lecture, which is about uh, genetic association studies. How do we find and identify correlations between specific genetic variants and a trait or disease of interest? So uh, broad speaking, there's two ways of going about this. Um, there, you can study uh, families of related individuals, either over multiple generations or in clusters like uh, two siblings and a parent, something like that, or uh, sorry, a, um, a parent and their two, uh, sorry, a child and their two parents, uh, for example, those would be family-based studies, okay, where you study families, um, or by studying groups of unrelated individuals, and that would be like population-based, uh, those are known as population-based studies. Okay, so each type of study is useful. Each one can reveal different kinds of information about the links between alleles uh, and traits. Uh, you know, the fact that they're both used would maybe suggest neither one is strictly superior to the other. They each have their pros and cons. So I'm going to try to talk about a little bit about both of them. So a classic example of a family-based study is the transmission disequilibrium test, or TDT. So the idea here um, is simply to find uh, parent-child pairs in which the child has the trait of interest and the parent is heterozygous for the locus of interest. So heterozygous meaning they have one copy of each version of the allele. So we know from the laws of genetics that the parent has a 50-50 chance of passing on each of those uh, alleles. Um, however, if we go out of our way only to find to sample situations in which the child has the trait of interest, okay, if there's a link between the locus and the trait of interest, then we won't see a 50-50 mix. We'll see them more likely to develop, you know, if we just look at children uh, who have this trait of interest, they'll be more likely to have the, the disease-causing allele, okay, if there's a link between the allele and the, and the disease. 
Okay, so um, just to kind of indicate here um, what's what's going on, you know, this is uh, the idea is equilibrium would be you pass on 50-50, you know, uh, equally likely to pass on either one, but maybe that's if, if you see a disequilibrium, if you see anything other than 50%, that indicates that there's a link between the uh, allele and the disease. Okay, so here's an example of a, you know, how we would know that a parent passed on a disease allele to their, or sorry, a, a not a disease, uh, passed on a certain allele uh, to their kid. Um, so in this situation, if the child has one, a copy of the A allele and a copy of the B allele, okay, well, we know they got the A allele from their father, therefore they must have gotten the B allele from their mother. Okay, so here's a situation in which we know that the mother was heterozygous and she passed on on a B allele. Um, so if we see a lot of pairs like, or a lot of you know, trios like this, that would indicate that the B allele is causing the disease. Uh, conversely, here's a different one where we know that uh, the heterozygous father passed on an A allele. If we see more things like this, then we would know that the A allele is, uh, more, is causing the disease uh, or contributing to the disease. Um, if they're equally matched, then you know, there's, no, uh, there's no link, okay? So that's the concept behind the transmission deeks this, transmission disequilibrium test. Um, and statistical tests involve calculating a quantity known as a p-value. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, are probably already familiar with what p-values are. Uh, but just to um, define it for you, okay, it's the probability of seeing results as extreme or more extreme than what you actually saw in the data due solely to random chance. Okay, so, you know, when we do this, we're going to be looking at the difference between pairs, you know, trios like this and trios like that. Um, undoubtedly, they won't be exactly the same, but the question is, is the imbalance or disequilibrium between them larger than you'd expect by chance alone? We can measure that with the p-value. What are the chances that we could see something, you know, so different by chance alone? Okay, um, so the idea here is that you're going to make the calculation based solely on chance alone. That's known as the null hypothesis. Um, if, for example, we do this calculation and we get a p-value of something like 0 0.001, then that would say, well, if chance alone were the explanation, then you would only see data that looks like ours, you know, one in a thousand times. Um, that would really cast some serious doubt on the null hypothesis. It wouldn't look like a very good explanation. The more likely explanation in that scenario would be that the disease is actually linked to the, to the allele we're studying. Okay, so just as an example of how this works, uh, here's a, um, one of the earliest transmission disequilibrium tests in 1989. Uh, they were looking at type one diabetes. They had 124 parent-child pairs in which the parent was heterozygous, the, the child had type one diabetes, uh, the allele they were looking at or the you know, um, you know, genetic variant they were looking at was uh, this flanking polymorphism which was near the insulin gene. And what they found was that of the 124 parent-child pairs, 78 of the children received what's called the class one version of this uh, variant from their parent and the other 46 uh, did not. So, um, the p-value is asking here if we, you know, it's probabilistically the same as, well, if we flipped a coin 124 times, how often would we see a heads tail split like this of 78 heads and 46 tails? Okay, I mean, that's uh, the same mathematical, math mathematically the two are equivalent. You know, a 50-50 thing, what's the chance of a 50-50 uh, event having this large of a split between the two possibilities? Um, I'll skip the calculations for the sake of this lecture, but you know, uh, it can be worked out. The calculation is uh, 0 0.005. So this would cause you to, cause one to conclude that the null here is not a likely explanation um, and that this flanking polymorphism actually is associated with disease risk. Okay, so that's how a type one, uh, this transmission disequilibrium test works. It's a, a classic example of a family-based test. Uh, in order to do this, we had to collect, you know, data on families and, you know, work this out in this way to try to see, um, you know, uh, whether the inheriting the disease and inheriting the uh, uh, allele uh, sort of went together or not. Okay, and the odds ratio, uh, since we also talked about odds ratios, if you divide these two, that gives you the odds ratio, uh, comes out in this case to be 1.7. So, um, you know, it seems like it uh, you know, leads to a 70% increase in the odds of type 1 diabetes if you uh, inherit this class 1 version of this uh, allele from your parent. Okay, so that's an example of a transmission disequilibrium test.
um, sorry, it's an example of a family-based test. The alternative would be to do something that's population-based where you don't get related people, you just get random samples from the population. Um, most common design here is the case control design. Uh, this means that, you know, you would, for example, if we're studying diabetes, get like 400 people with diabetes, 400 people without diabetes, uh, and get genotypes on all of those people and then do an analysis there. Uh, so a common type of analysis there could be a chi-squared test or Fisher's exact test, um, linear regression, logistic regression. If you know what these things are, great. If you don't, uh, the point, that's not uh, critical. The point is that, I mean, these are all sort of classic statistical methods. They're not specific to genetics. Um, and with population-based studies, you don't necessarily need specific genetic methods. You can use, um, you know, usually this is the assumption that um, standard statistical methods make is that you have a random sample from the population. So if that's what you're doing, then you can use any of the kind of regular statistical methods to, to analyze the data. Okay, so here's, what, here's an example of uh, another study, uh, also diabetes, but this is type 2 diabetes. Um, here's we have the cases and controls, and this is how the um, uh, actual genotypes broke down between um, uh, looking at a genetic mutation in this uh, gene here. Um, under the null, what you'd expect is the following. Um, you can calculate just kind of, uh, you know, if, if this low, if inheriting this uh, uh, locus had enough, nothing to do with case control, this is, you know, what you'd expect the breakdown to be. So you can see here that in reality, it seemed like uh, among the cases, there were more people with the TT uh, genotype than you'd expect, and also more people with the GT genotype than you expect. So this seems to indicate that inheriting the T allele does increase your chances of the disease uh, to some extent. Um, now, if you do a calculation here, um, again, this, this would be uh, a chi-squared test or a Fisher's exact test would give you um, this kind of calculation. It comes up to be three in 100, so 0 0.03. This would be reasonably convincing evidence, not as convincing as like one in a thousand, but uh, it seems like chance is a relatively unlikely explanation here. So there's some evidence here that the T allele is associated with increased risk of type 2 diabetes. Um, one just quick thing I'll mention here is that this analysis that I just did here doesn't assume any kind of order to the genotypes. Um, you know, a common, a big part of this kind of test usually is deciding whether or not you want to assume that say, well, if inheriting one T allele is bad, then inheriting two T alleles would probably be twice as bad. Like if this is an odds ratio, you know, of say, if this say increases the odds by 10%, then this should increase the odds by another 10%, you know, in, in assuming kind of an additive effect of each uh, T allele, okay? Uh, if you assume that here, you can get an even more powerful, even smaller p-value here of 0.01. And um, this is just uh, worth mentioning here because this is kind of comes up in a lot of genetic analyses and it's just comes up a lot in statistics. Oftentimes there's a trade-off uh, between um, increased power and increased assumptions. Ideally, you don't want to make a lot of assumptions, but oftentimes, uh, you know, if you want, uh, you know, the cost of not making assumptions is usually it diminishes your power. So there's sort of a trade-off here. Um, you know, uh, certainly the assumptions could be wrong, in which case this isn't, uh, you know, you, you wouldn't want to make them. But if you make an assumption and it's the, the correct assumption, then you tend to get uh, an increase in power of your tests. And that, that happens a lot in statistics. Okay, so um, one important complication uh, in population-based studies is this idea of um, you know, population stratification. Um, so you, the appeal of population-based studies in some sense is that they're easy. It's easy to recruit, it's easier to recruit individual unrelated people than it is families of people. Um, you know, it's easier to do, they're easier to analyze because you can just use regular statistical methods, they cost less, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, they're easier to do. Um, but why then do people some, you know, why isn't that just what everybody does? Well, one big risk in population-based studies is the introduction of bias from a population known as, uh, from a phenomenon known as population stratification. So population-based genetic studies generally rely on an assumption like what we mentioned earlier that, um, you know, basically the equivalent of everybody just draws their genetic variants randomly from the big gene pool that's available in the society at large. Uh, but that's not uh, 
always what happens. In practice, that's not usually what happens. You don't, you know, in reality, people aren't just equally likely to have children with everybody else in society. You have populations that sort of segregate and, you know, that have, you know, somewhat, somewhat different gene pools that they draw from. So just as an example of why this is a problem, suppose we carried out a genetic association of heart disease in Europe. Okay, genetic information eh, is probably somewhat evenly mixed in, across Europe, but it's not like completely evenly mixed. Let's just say, you know, if we have uh, you know, British individuals and French individuals, I mean, the British individuals would be more likely to have children with other British individuals and French individuals would be more likely to have children with other French individuals uh, and so on. Um, and so certain alleles will be slightly more common uh, in France than they will be in Britain, let's say. All right, why is that a problem? Well, because there's other differences, other cultural, other geographic differences between British and French individuals as well. Um, so for example, smoking is a lot more common in France than in the United Kingdom. So if you do an associate population-based study here, maybe you would see an association between an allele and heart disease, uh, but in reality that allele has nothing to do with heart disease, it's just an allele that's more common in France and French people are more likely to smoke, and smoking is definitely associated with heart disease, so that's what you're seeing. It has nothing to do with a, an actual genetic relationship between um, you know, the, the allele and heart disease, but instead is due to this uh, phenomenon of population stratification. So this is a, an example of what's known in statistics as confounding. Um, you have this confounding factor here, in this case smoking, that's getting in the way of uh, confusing or confounding this your attempt to study the relationship between genetics and heart disease here. And it's a major source of potential bias in population-based studies. Um, thankfully, the situation is not entirely hopeless. It's not like, oh, well, population-based studies are just worthless then because they're all subject to this bias. There are ways that you can try to uh, adjust for those. And I'll just talk about one of them kind of briefly here, something called principal components analysis. Uh, and so I'll just illustrate with a sort of a simple simulated study uh, here. The genetic data is real. Uh, I simulated the outcome or the trait phenotype here. Um, so in my simulation, uh, the uh, first SNP is the only one that actually has any impact on the outcome here, but um, you know, in this uh, um, particular data set that had, uh, there were um, people of different genetic ancestries and there was some, so I'm making it so the Japanese had a higher value of whatever this simulated outcome was and African Americans had a lower, um, uh, you know, that tended to have lower values on average of this, of this outcome here. So um, I don't have time, unfortunately, to get into the details uh, today of what, how principal components works and what it does, but basically it attempts to extract from all of these genetic numbers to identify which uh, genetic variants are most different between, uh, you know, all of the people in the sample and then sort of give some people a number, you know, uh, on the basis of the first thing. So every uh, genetic variant would have a score associated with it. You add all that up and you get your first principal component score and you'd have your second principal component score. And you can see here how, you know, in the end, how it separates out the four different populations that we had in this study. Um, so the first principal component largely separates uh, people of African uh, genetic ancestry uh, from Europeans and Japanese, whereas the second principal component it largely separates out Japanese from uh, Europeans. And the African American population sort of exists on a bit of a bit of a spectrum here between the European population and African population, you know, different people are different places on there, which, you know, makes sense given the um, history of the group. Um, okay, so, um, so this is, you know, these things that we can calculate, two principal components, and we can add these into the analysis, uh, adjust for these principal components, um, and, you know, let's just see what kind of effect that has. Um, here is a um, uh, illustration, principal components of, uh, just if we don't do any sort of adjustment, uh, we just do a straightforward population-based test. This one has some problems. The red one is the only one that's actually associated with the outcome. Um, these are, you know, p-values, so really small p-values, really significant results would be higher uh, on this scale, and I'll just draw a dotted line here as the, let's say it's some threshold we have, I'll talk more about this in a second, but the threshold we have for declaring that something's a real finding. Um, this didn't work out very well because we didn't find 
the actual thing that's associated with the outcome. And we found a bunch of stuff that is not actually associated with the outcome. It just happens to be more common, let's say, in, in Japanese individuals. So we have a bunch of false positives and a false negative. It's, this was a bad analysis. It didn't, didn't, uh, it gave us misleading information about the genetic causes of the disease. But once we add in those principal components, uh, these are the results, okay? Uh, once we adjust for it and eliminate this effect of population stratification, or at least, you know, adjust for it, maybe we can't eliminate it entirely. Now, we, you know, don't have these false positives, uh, and we did find the, um, the actual causative, uh, you know, allele uh, there. So, um, you know, that's kind of the promise of, uh, of doing this, uh, this kind of thing. It's an important issue in any po kind of population-based study. So, I may mean, say that, um, Population-based studies are easy to do, but they're subject to these bias, this bias here unless you do it carefully, unless you try to eliminate this uh, impact of population stratification. Okay, that's an important uh, issue to be aware of. Okay, <clears throat> because family-based studies don't get random samples from the population, don't make these assumptions that you're just drawing from a generic gene pool, they aren't subject to these, pop these biases due to stratification, population stratification. That's one of the, the nice things about family-based studies. That's their big uh, advantage, okay? Um, you know, and so they also provide protection from other types of confounders like you know, geography, socioeconomic status, things like that. Um, so those are some of the big advantages of, of family-based studies, but the big advantage of population-based studies is oftentimes it's recruitment's easier, which means it's easier to get larger sample sizes. And maybe one that wouldn't be as obvious is that uh, there's greater genetic diversity among unrelated individuals. So typically that means that you have higher power and more precision in terms of being able to locate risk alleles more precisely in the genome, exactly where they are. Okay, and usually lower cost. This kind of goes hand in hand. So you can, with the same, depending on how you look at it, with the same cost, you can get higher sample sizes or, you know, uh, with the same sample size, it'll be lower cost. Anyway. Okay, so I guess I only have a few minutes left uh, here uh, before we stop for questions. So I'll try my best to uh, talk about some of these genome-wide issues. Uh, I may have to skip a little bit here, but um, in general, when one is testing a single hypothesis, people start to be convinced, start to find p-values less than about 0 0.05, mm, you know, start to be convinced. Um, but in genetics, that's not really the case anymore. Um, if you're testing a lot of genetic variants, um, that kind of changes, uh, you know, the meaning of the 5% cutoff. So for example, let's say we did a thousand tests at a thousand genetic loci. What are the chances that we'd find at least one p-value below 0.05? Uh, well, um, turns out the probability is basically absolute certainty. The probability is you'll find at least one significant uh, result, even if there's nothing going on uh, is, you know, 0 0.999999 way out, you know, past the right end of the screen, okay? Um, this is obviously not satisfactory. 5% is not a meaningful uh, thing because no matter what, you will always find something that's associated with the outcome, even in cases where there's nothing associated with the outcome. So this is clearly unsatisfactory. Uh, we need to do something uh, to rethink this 5% um, number. And what's, what's most commonly done, this isn't the only way to do it, but what's most commonly done is to take that 5% number and divide it by the number of tests you're doing, okay? So if we're doing this 1,000 tests, we wouldn't compare p-values to 0.05 to see if they were important. We'd compare them to 0.05 over 1,000, so 0 0.00005. Um, Okay, so, you know, this is uh, usually, this was that, um, you've already seen a plot like this before, but this is what that dotted line from earlier uh, looked like. This was the cutoff, the Bonferroni uh, cutoff, where we divided 0.05 by the number of tests we're doing. Um, and this is, this is what this uh, dotted line, this was the dotted line that earlier plot was, and that's what the dotted line is here. Okay, so this is uh, often referred to as a Manhattan plot. You know, we've got the um, all the SNPs here, all the genetic variants in the whole genome here that we're testing, and here's the cutoff, and we're trying to see, you know, is there a peak anywhere that, you know, rises above this threshold, okay? So this is just some simulated uh, data. Um, here is some actual uh, genetic data from one of the first big gen genome-wide studies. Um, this was uh, done with this giant sample size, 17,000 uh, people looking at, trying to look at all these different uh, disorders. And you can see they definitely found some things, you know, but it, they're varied a lot by disease. Right, I mean, uh, the um, 
genome-wide lines somewhere around seven, you know, those plots of the ones that are in red achieve genome-wide significance. You see, like for Crohn's disease, they found all kinds of stuff. Okay, they found this locus, that locus, you know, a whole bunch of loci associated with the uh, outcome. For coronary artery disease, they basically just found the one, and for bipolar disorder, they basically found almost nothing. Okay, um, now we know bipolar disorder is heritable. And yet, when they did this study, they didn't find anything. Um, so this is, you know, led to a big, um, big debate. And this is one of the big, um, you know, big questions, central questions in sort of genetics and uh, statistical genetics, you know, over the past, um, you know, decade or so. You know, like why sometimes, you know, we know these things are heritable, and yet where is it? You know, uh, why can't we find any uh, variants that are significantly associated with the outcome? And I'll just try to um, quickly wrap up the story and wrap up my slides here, um, and then we'll have to see if anybody has questions. But um, you know, um, I'll kind of skip uh, this. So this is this um, idea. You know, wh where is it? Why weren't we able to find? Uh, you know, the heritability here, like, um, you know, the heritability of height, for example, we know that's around 80%, but, you know, significant hits from these genome-wide association studies only explain like 5%, 15% of variability in height. Like why, um, you know, where, you know, is this missing heritability? Okay. One possible, there's basically two schools of thought on this, and then I'll leave it there as like a mystery because we don't know the answer really to this yet. But one possibility is that it lies in a form of genetic variation that we haven't studied well yet. So for example, you know, more rare uh, variants, like these are only looking at relatively, you know, the, whatever. Uh, uh, Skip my slide. You know, uh, here we're only looking at like the most common uh, genetic variants. Uh, maybe there are things that weren't on these chips that are more rare and that didn't get included. Um, maybe that's a, an issue. Maybe it's not so much the genetic sequence itself, but there's this thing called copy number variation. Maybe you have an extra copy of a of a gene or a, you know one fewer copy of the gene. Maybe that's what's important. Maybe there's genetic interactions, like what matters is not that you have this specific variant or that one, but you have both of them together, and that's the kind of thing that's causing uh, the disease. Or maybe there's gene environment interactions, or maybe there's epigenetics. You know, there's all these you know, possibilities that you know, would explain heritability, but not in a way that um, we would measure uh, with the kind of studies that we're usually doing, these genome-wide association studies. Um, the other possibility is just that, you know, Basically, what's going on in the lower left corner of that figure? They're they're there, they have an impact, but just their effect sizes are too small to be found in our studies with the current size. So, you know, under this paradigm, there aren't just say ten or twenty genetic variants that affect complex diseases, but potentially a lot more than that. You know, maybe thousands of variants out there that each make small contributions to say bipolar disorder. Um, so, for example, a recent effort combined, you know, just uh, pooled together 79 different genome-wide association studies to do this enormous genome-wide association study uh, on height. Um, their sample size was incredible. It was over half a million, or sorry, quarter of a million people. Um, and they estimated that, I won't get that to how, but they estimated that 62% of all SNPs, so not just like 10 or 20 variants affect height, but like thousands, hundreds of thousands of uh, polymorphisms have some sort of effect on height, um, you know, just, but potentially a really small effect on height, okay? And if you put together those SNPs, uh, they were able to explain about 69% of the variability in human height, potentially almost all of the missing heritability. So one possibility is that, you know, so two, two big schools of thought, two biggest possibilities, and this is kind of where I'll, I'll end it, you know, is it some kind of more exotic form of genetic variant that variation that we haven't studied yet? Or is it more an issue that we just need larger sample sizes because things are there, they're having an effect, it's just it's small and hard to see and we haven't been able to see it yet. Okay, so I will uh, stop there and see if people have questions. I guess I went slightly over time, sorry about that, but um, trying to get this in. Okay, let me see chat. Okay, question. Um, can we use the population-based analysis for case-case comparison instead of case control? Um, I am not 100% uh, sure what you mean by case-case comparison in the sense that, I mean, the, usually the idea here in a case control study, um, let's go back to like the data from one, um, you know, would be that you would have, You'd be wanting to understand, you know, whether or not there's a genetic variation here that's associated with diabetes. So you'd want to compare, say, 
people with diabetes to people without diabetes, and that's the idea. I'm not sure what you mean exactly by a by a case case comparison in the sense that you know, um, like the idea of the study usually is we're trying to find if there's something that's more common in people with diabetes than without diabetes, you know, between cases and controls. Uh, maybe I just don't understand the question, but. Um, Otherwise, anybody can feel free to either type something in the chat or unmute yourself and ask. Or, or, or clarify, if you're the person who asked this question, clarify. Um, okay, um, okay, so people with diabetes in different populations. Um, okay, so if you were doing like a test of whether or not um, you know, allele frequencies differ between people with diabetes um, between different populations. Um, okay, um, kind of an interesting question. I, mean, I guess the thing that I would be um, not totally clear on that uh, is that, I mean, I, w to what purpose? I and mean, if the idea is that we're trying to find things that are associated with disease, then I mean, you'll need some controls on there. You'll need some people without the disease. Um, I mean, certainly there will be alleles that differ in frequency between, you know, one population and another population, but that doesn't necessarily tell you anything about disease. Um, maybe I'm just not following the uh, line of thought, but I guess I'm, I'm, I'm going to this with the, the idea that we're trying to find genetic variants that, you know, are associated with a disease or a phenotype. And that's what we're trying to discover. Okay, so let me see. That was another good question. Um, uh, you mentioned case control studies. What is the role of cohort studies? Um, yeah, so cohort studies are definitely done. I, yeah, I said that um, this is the most uh, common uh, type is the case control study, but it does, certainly doesn't have to be, okay? For sure, um, cohort studies are definitely used too. Uh, I've been involved in, you know, multiple cohort studies. Um, yeah, it depends on, um, you know, so the idea, in the um, different, the idea here is that the difference between, um, you know, the, the appeal of a cohort, uh, a case control study is that you know that you would get a significant number of people uh, who have the disease. A cohort study, you'd be um, starting from the beginning, you don't know in advance whether people have the disease or not, and you're sort of waiting to see. Um, there are a number of uh, advantages of doing cohort studies, um, but you know, one potential uh, thing that just one reason why people, it doesn't always fit every project, uh, is that um, then you're sort of at the mercy of how many people develop this disorder. Like, for example, if you were doing a study of breast cancer, um, it wouldn't make for a great cohort study because you'd have to wait for a really long time to find out whether or not people got breast cancer. And the vast majority of your sample wouldn't get breast cancer. Um, so, you know, that would be a reason why people don't do them. Now, you certainly can. It's just a question. I mean, there's nothing incorrect about doing it. It's just uh, the um, you know, kind of a, for power reasons, people often focus on case control studies. But certainly, uh, you, you know, if you're in a situation where the event you're looking at is reasonably common, uh, certainly you can also do cohort studies. Uh, yeah. um, okay, uh, let's see here. Um, uh, well, let's see. Uh, so I guess it's a, about one. Um, I could, um, yeah, I feel bad that I didn't totally um, uh, address the one student's uh, question that I don't think I totally follow. Um, you know, uh, multi, you know, multiple ethnic groups for the same disease. I mean, yeah, I think that's certainly an issue um, and that kind of gets into this uh, question here of, you know, population stratification uh, and so on. I mean, you know, again, there's, there's multiple ways to do it either by including additional things that you adjust for or by, you know, kind of stratifying and doing separate analyses for the different ethnic groups and then trying to either combine them or looking for differences across the ethnic groups. Um, yeah, I don't necessarily have, um, uh, you know, uh, time to go into exactly all of that, but that's something that you could do too. I, I kind of talked about just like an adjustment for it, um, but you know, another possibility is that maybe different uh, alleles, you know, have different impacts in the different groups, and that would be an interesting thing to study too. There, you'd have to, um, you know, have kind of some interactions between the, the, the population group you're in and the the allele. Um, okay, I'm not, I'm not, this would be probably an easier thing to, uh, you know, have a you know 
interactive conversation about. But um, hopefully, um, people um, thought this was useful. Um, and um, thank you for uh, your attention. And feel free to email me, I guess, if you have any questions that I didn't, um, or I wasn't able to get to. Sounds good, Patrick. Um, or feel free to email me. I'm more than happy to pass it along. You guys all have my email. Um, you guys have a good week and we'll see you again next week for our last lecture. Take care, everyone. Okay. Bye.